Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, welcome to the first ever virtual size carry webinar um, entitled Debt Relief with Chinese Characteristics. My name is Yoon Jung Park, and I'm the Associate Director here at Cary. Today's event is based on extensive research that was carried out by Professor Deborah Braudigam, together with um, Kevin Acker and Yufan Huang, who are also with us at Cary. Um, before going on to some basic housekeeping and introductions, we wanted to acknowledge the generous support of our funder, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, without whom our work would not be possible. Since we only have about an hour for this event, we're going to keep things very tight. The paper presentation is going to run for 20 to 25 minutes. Um, I'll pop in again to introduce our three distinguished discussants who you see there on camera. Um, Dr. David Dollar, um, Mr. Jude Moore, and um, Professor uh, John Wei Wang. Um, each of the discussants are going to have five minutes to give their remarks. And finally, we should have about 10 minutes left for Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, either during the presentation um, of the paper or um, while the discussants are speaking, you may type these into the Q&A function of Zoom. Marie Foster, Carrie's program coordinator, and I will be monitoring and collating um, similar questions for the last 10 minutes of our session. Um, during the, the event, both Kevin and Yufan will also be monitoring the Q&A um, and they will attend to any questions that they can um, answer briefly um, in writing in the Q&A um, function. Marie will also be adding additional information to the chat as we go along, but again, any vital information and links will also be available on our website sent out to our uh, mailing list next week. With that, um, allow me to introduce our speakers. Um, our first speaker will be Professor Deborah Braudigam. She is the Bernard L. Schwartz Professor of International Political Economy and the founding director of the China Africa Research Initiative, or CARI, here at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Um, she's been writing about the fact and fiction of China and Africa, state building, governance, and foreign aid for more than 30 years. She is the author of three books on China and Africa, including The Dragon's Gift, The Real Story of China in Africa. And her current research focuses on Chinese lending in risky overseas markets. Kevin Acker is Size Carey's research manager. He is a 2019 MA graduate of China Studies and Economics at Johns Hopkins Size, having spent the first year of this program at Hopkins Nanjing Center. He previously worked in international education and consulting. He holds a BA in economics and China studies from Binghamton University. And finally, Yufan Huang is the research assistant at Cary. He graduated from Johns Hopkins SAIS also in 2019 with an MA in international relations with a concentration in China studies. From 2014 to 2017, he was a researcher for the New York Times Beijing Bureau focusing on China-related foreign and defense affairs. He has a BA from International Politics from Renmin University of China. With that, I'll hand it over to Deborah. Thank you, Yoon, and welcome everyone to our first webinar. As China is poised to become the world's largest creditor, concerns about debt sustainability have grown. Yet considerable confusion exists over what's likely to happen when a government runs into trouble repaying its Chinese loans. So we undertook a study of Chinese debt relief, both in Africa and in other cases around the world. We did this starting last summer. Um, we saw that the scale of Chinese lending in debt distressed countries and some debt distressed countries was quite high and that this was going to become a growing issue. But there were multiple misconceptions about what China was likely to do and what China had already done in the past. And just to point out again that most of this research was completed in the pre-COVID-19 era. So this is a quick snapshot of our database on Chinese lending. And I want to point out here that even though our data is often used to say that African governments owe China this much money, um, we find that th these are Chinese loan commitments. 
And it takes about five years for a loan to be fully dispersed. So the actual outstanding debt is going to be a lot lower. Our totals are about 152 billion from 2000 through 2018. And out of this, it's also important to point out that Angola makes up about $43 billion in loan commitments. That's about 28% of our data. So uh, it's really the lion's share. And when we look at the trends, uh, aside from Angola, if we look at the blue trends, Chinese lending reached a peak in 2013. This shows um, the number of different lenders that we have in our database. The blue is China Exim Bank, so that's really the largest creditor, China's export credit agency. But China Development Bank has been growing, so those are the red parts of the bars. And commercial banks have also been making up in recent years uh, quite a bit of Chinese finance. Green is for Chinese companies, and then a very small uh, orange bar is the Chinese central government, and these are the zero interest loans. So our uh, estimates about China Exim Bank's total exposure or total loan commitments um, are about 86 to $87 billion. And this is actually very close to what the Exim Bank has announced uh, as its uh, loan commitments in July 2019. So this depicts what we call the very worst case scenario. Because we don't have data on disbursements or outstanding debt, this um, graph here shows the total Chinese loan commitments on the left-hand side. And this is as a percent of, of uh, gross national income. And along the bottom, it's external debt as a percent of gross national income. So what this scatter plot shows, um, we also have the countries marked in red and orange that are uh, estimated by the IMF and the World Bank to be in debt distress or in high risk of debt distress. And this was at, in their most recent publication in April. So what we can see from this is that um, Chinese loan commitments in any case are a very real factor um, and, and the most important factor in only four countries in the Republic of Congo, Angola, Zambia, and Djibouti. So in a number of other countries, uh, for example, um, in uh, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Chinese lending is also higher, um, but there are many other lenders uh, active in those countries as well. So China's part of a, of a whole array of creditors. So in the media, we see a lot of different um, assumptions about what the Chinese are doing. And I think the um, assumptions about malign China are far more prevalent. So the New York Times recently wrote that Chinese loans require refinancing every couple of years. Uh, Bloomberg said China's offered relief but demanded control of prized state assets. And Moody's uh, said that Kenya assets risk seizure by the Chinese. We actually uh, don't find support for any of those um, assumptions in our data. But on the other hand, there are these assumptions about benign China. Forbes wrote that debt write-offs are common. China's a free money machine. And The Guardian quoted a, a Zambian economist saying, Chinese debt can easily be renegotiated, restructured, or refinanced. And we also don't find support for those statements. So what do the numbers tell us in our database of Chinese debt relief? Well, the first thing to point out is that China made its first loan to Africa in 1960, and that was to Guinea. And so during the course of the 70s and the 80s, um, as African economies plunged into economic crisis, many of these loans were not repaid. In fact, by one estimate, only 14% of China's zero interest loans from this era were ever repaid. So between 1980 and 2000, we already see multiple restructurings. So these were almost always just a lengthening of the repayment period. By the 1990s, there were some debt, some debt equity swaps for these loans. Then when we get to 2000, the Chinese started in on a debt cancellation program. This only relates, as we shall see, to the zero interest loans. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail. And also during this period, the restructurings continue and they take the same general format of a lengthening of the repayment period up until about 2015. And then we start to see more, uh, a variety of other kinds of responses, which we'll talk about. So the debt cancellations over the last two decades have been more than $3.4 billion. The Chinese have canceled, according to their figures, 328 separate loans. And according to our figures, we've seen 94 cases in 40 countries. And each of these cases can be multiple loans. It's not always um, clearly stated how many loans have been, how many debts have been canceled. Um, but we see about an average of 30 million. So we're not talking about very large numbers here. 
And again, these are almost exclusively the zero interest loans, which is a foreign aid instrument of the central government. Here we see on the, um, the left-hand column, we've got the value of these zero interest loan debt cancellations. They reached a peak in 2013, which was the same year that the Belt and Road Initiative, China's uh, Overseas Connectivity and Lending and Investment Program was launched. And um, on the right, we see the uh, percentage of total lending. So we can see in the early part of this millennium, a very large percentage of Chinese loans still were in the zero interest loan category, but that quickly changed. In this slide, we have the debt cancellations by year. And down in the bottom box, uh, down in the bottom line, we have these red boxes. And these are years in which the Chinese government made pledges to cancel debt. And the way these pledges work, and we'll talk about a, a very recent pledge that happened yesterday in a moment, but these pledges are usually announced by the Chinese president or one of the very high leaders in China. And they apply to the, the debt that is outstanding from these zero interest loans in a particular year. So for, for example, in 2006, a Chinese president may announce that all of the zero interest loans that have reached maturity in 2006, but are still outstanding, i.e. they're in arrears, those are the ones that will be canceled. So it's even a smaller category. It's not all of those zero interest loans. And we can see that after each of these pledges, there's a, a bump upward in loan cancellations, but the largest ones happened earlier in the millennium. And that's because those were wiping up those um, bad debts from the um, old debt crisis era of the 80s and, and into the 90s. So debt restructuring and refinancing is a different um, kettle of fish now. We find that the Chinese have restructured and refinanced in Africa over $15 billion. We've got 16 cases of restructuring, but only one of refinancing. We've got at least 26 different loans that were restructured, worth about $15 billion for at least 20 projects, restructured and refinanced. 11 of these cases had a maturity extension, and at least four loans had their interest rates reduced, and there may be others as well. So I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Kevin Acker, who's going to walk us through some of the case studies um, on this chart on the debt restructuring. Kevin, over to you. Thank you, Deborah. So this slide um, includes all of our cases of restructuring and excludes the case of Angola, which is our only refinancing case. But as you can see here, the debt restructuring cases show a wide range of treatments, uh, ranging from a reprofiling of debt service payments within the original maturity uh, which essentially means uh, a Chinese lender can offer a short grace period um, at any point in a loan's maturity, um, but the deferred payments still have to be repaid by the, uh, by the due date that, at which the uh, loan was originally signed. And then on the other end, we have uh, uh, restructurings that include uh, both maturity extensions and interest rate reductions, which can offer significant debt relief. So now I'm going to walk through two cases, uh, the Angola refinancing case and the restructuring case of the Republic of Congo. Both of these cases show uh, the sensitivity of these two countries to the commodity or the oil price uh, crash in 2015. So in Angola's case, um, immediately prior to the, uh, the oil price crash, uh, the Angolan oil state-owned company, uh, Sonangol, borrowed uh, a lot from Chinese lenders, including $7.5 billion from China Development Bank and $2.5 billion from ICBC. Um, and when the price of oil did crash, uh, and Sonangol was having a lot of trouble paying these loans back, so the Angolan president requested restructuring. Uh, they did not get a restructuring, but instead China Development Bank offered a $15 billion line of credit to the Angolan government, which is the largest line of credit we've seen um, China extend to any government in Africa. And in 2016, Angola contributed $10 billion uh, from this line of credit uh, to recapitalize Sonangol. And we know from uh, Sonangol's bond prospectuses, or Angola's bond prospectuses, that most of this was used to prepay Sonangol's debt to the China Development Bank that they had borrowed in the previous years. So essentially, the China Development Bank uh, refinanced its loans to Sonangol, and uh, the Angolan state was able to shift these uh, debts from the books of Sonangol to the, to the state, essentially. In the Republic of Congo, uh, we see a different, a different story. It's a different, different uh, profile of lenders. Um, and it's a restructuring rather than a refinancing app. And all the other cases in our, in our data are, are restructurings. Um, so in the Republic of Congo is a, is a, is a, a large borrow from China. They've signed uh, about $5 billion of loan commitments with China for 34 infrastructure projects. 
about half of this was signed in the period immediately prior to the oil price crash. And as you can see in this, as you can see in the graph, the, uh, the uh, blue part of the columns are the loans that were included in the restructuring agreement with Exim Bank. By 2017, the Republic of Congo was in debt distress and it had a debt to GDP ratio of 120%. At this point, they approached the IMF for an assistance package. And according to the IMF debt sustainability analysis, uh, the China's the uh, ROC's debt to China was unsustainable and they were going to have to restructure that uh, before the, the, they were going to be able to receive an assistance package from the IMF. Mm -hmm. And we suspect that um, the, their work with the IMF at this time influenced the negotiations with China heavily. Um, so first to restructure was the Chinese contractor China Machinery, China Machinery Engineering Corporation, which rescheduled about $116 million in, in arrears um, with the ROC. And then after another year of uh, negotiations, the Republic of Congo reached the large restructuring agreement with Exim Bank. And Exim Bank agreed to restructure um, $1.6 billion of outstanding debt on eight loans that the ROC had borrowed. And uh, so each of these loans got a maturity extension of about 15 years. And each of the interest rate on each of the loans was reduced as well. One of the biggest loans in this package was the loan for uh, National Route, uh, the second half of, of National Route 1. So those are the two cases, and now I'll pass it back to Deborah, who will talk about China and the Paris Club. Thank you, Kevin. I think it's also important um, to point out that the ROC case is, is interesting in that it shows very clearly that there were separate negotiations going on with the Chinese contractor and with uh, China Exim Bank. So there's no China Incorporated. All of the different lenders that we showed in the earlier slide need to do their negotiations separately. And so this complicates any effort at uh, debt relief and restructuring. So China and the Paris Club. Um, we have compared because we were quite interested in knowing to what extent China is, is getting closer to um, what is not global, but what is a very important entity um, for providing a, a forum for debt restructuring negotiations amongst different creditors. In Africa, the Paris Club is no longer very important. According to the World Bank, only about 5% of um, public and publicly guaranteed debt is owed to Paris Club lenders. And about 16 or 17% is owed to China. About 18% is owed to the World Bank. So these are really China and the international financial institutions are really the, the big players now, not the Paris Club. But nonetheless, the Paris Club is an important um, source of rulemaking for restructuring. So the Paris Club evolved over time. From its founding in 1956 through 1988, they only offered what are called classic terms. This was non-concessional rescheduling. There was no debt relief, no uh, write-offs at all. And it was only in 1988 that Toronto terms were, were agreed upon. And this allowed some debt reduction for the poorest countries. And as we know, over time, the Paris Club allowed greater and greater debt reduction. But it was only about 2005 when the multilaterals um, uh, joined, well, the, in 1996 and then later in 2005 when multilateral debt cancellation became um, quite significant for the poorest countries. And this was financed by and large by the Paris Club members. So um, some have said that it took a while before the political will um, and the financial ability to do this debt relief coincided for the Paris Club members. Now in China, we also see an evolution. Between 1975 and 2000, they rescheduled the maturities, mainly these were interest-free government loans, and this was again um, non-concessional rescheduling. And then in 2000, they began regularly announced write-offs of these accumulated rears for that particular category of loans for the highly indebted poor countries. <coughs> And then also in that year, we see the maturity reschedule for some Exim Bank and company loans and occasionally interest rate reductions. But there's no um, general pattern here as a, opposed to what you see in the Paris Club. And then in 2020, China joined the G20 for the debt moratorium. So this was the first time China had joined with other countries uh, as part of an overall uh, agreement to do something about debt. So some differences between China and the Paris Club. In the Paris Club, there's coordination with other creditors. There's intra-creditor transparency, although it's not that transparent outside of the Paris Club. So for example, if you or I were trying to get information, we wouldn't be able to get all of that information from the creditors. China, there's no coordination. And we, we're not even sure what happens in Beijing 
uh, Lauren Johnson has suggested that there might be, or there should be, a Dongchang Club uh, in China's financial district where all the different creditors get together and try to allocate the responsibility, but we don't think that's happened so far. And the Paris Club also um, surprised us to find out that they had punitive penalties on arrears. And there's one very surprising example that I'll give you from this. In 2010, Sudan, which has not yet received any debt relief under the HIPAA initiative, they owed Austria, Denmark, and Belgium $4.5 billion. And out of this, 900 million was the principal, and 3.6 billion <coughs> was interest arrears, late interest penalties, and other penalties um, for not having paid that debt. So when we look at this across Africa, a lot of the debt crisis that happened earlier was because of these penalties and not just because of the outstanding principal. So um, the Paris Club requires an IMF program. China doesn't, but it seems that it helps in getting restructuring to happen to have, uh, because China is an IMF member. Debt write-offs started only when the Paris Club could, have, could afford it. And China started debt write-offs in 2000, but only for interest-free loans. China's per capita income today is far lower than the per capita income of the Paris Club in 1988 when they started offering these debt write-offs. And then the Paris Club treats the entire portfolio of a, different, of a particular creditor, but China seems to do debt treatment loan by loan. So there are questions about the G20 pledge. Um, and these questions have not all been answered, although President Xi Jinping did uh, shed some light on it in the speech that he gave yesterday. But the questions are which Chinese loans will be covered by this debt moratorium and which Chinese creditors will be part of it. Uh, according to Xi Jinping, he said once again, the zero interest loans uh, that have matured in 2020 and are still outstanding will be canceled. So this is something that we could expect. And the Chinese government will implement the DSSI for bilateral official loans. And we suspect that at least within this, the concessional loans and the preferential export buyer's credit will be covered because these are government to government loans. And then President Xi said that they will, he will encourage, that they will encourage China, Chinese financial institutions um, to hold friendly consultations and work out arrangements for commercial loans with sovereign guarantees. So we are hoping that this encouragement means that they're actually going to do it because to be encouraged by the president would, uh, in China is, a, is quite a, a strong encouragement. So we'll see how this plays out, but we have yet to have a case study where this has happened so that we can know some of the details. So to wrap up our findings, we did not find any asset seizures in any of the cases that we looked at in Africa. And next week we'll be having a, uh, another event on Thursday in which we'll be talking more about this question of asset seizures and the waiver of sovereign immunity. Um, despite contract clauses requiring arbitration, we saw no evidence of the use of courts to enforce payments or any application of penalty interest rates. In nearly all cases, China has only offered debt write-offs for zero interest loans. There's no China incorporated. Um, for interest-bearing loans, treatments for intergovernmental debt and Chinese company no loans need to be negotiated separately and often loan by loan rather than for the entire portfolio. While rescheduling by increasing the repayment period is common, changes in interest rates or reductions in principle are not. Um, refinancing is also uncommon. We only found one case. And although Chinese lenders have applied Paris Club terms to some rescheduling on the borrower's request, Chinese lenders prefer to address restructuring quietly on a bilateral basis, tailoring programs to each situation. Yet this lack of transparency fuels suspicions about Chinese intentions. These patterns are likely to play out as Chinese lenders and African borrowers grapple with the impact of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah and Kevin and uh, Yufan, although he didn't speak, um, participated in the presentation and the um, paper research. Um, now we're going to hear from our three discussants. We're thrilled to have the participation of three distinguished scholars um, and practitioners who have all had an opportunity to read in advance a copy of the paper upon which this presentation is based. Um, first, we're going to hear from David Dollar. Dr. David Dollar is a senior fellow um, at the um, 
China Center at the Brookings Institute um, and host of the Brookings Trade Podcast, Dollar and Cents. <laughs> um, he is the leading expert on China's economy and the U.S.-China economic relations. Um, from 2009 until 2013, um, Dr. Dollar was the U.S. Treasury's economic and financial emissary to China based in Beijing facilitating the macroeconomic and financial policy dialogue between the United States and China. Prior to joining Treasury, um, Dr. Dollar worked for 20 years at the World Bank, and among his many positions there, he served as country director for China and Mongolia and was based in Beijing between 2004 and, 20, uh, and 2009. His publications focus on economic reform in China, globalization, and economic growth. He holds a doctorate in economics from NYU um, and a bachelor's in Chinese history and language from Dartmouth College. Our next discussant will be Mr. W. Jude Moore. Mr. Moore is a senior policy fellow at the Center for Global Development, where his research focus is infrastructure finance in Africa and the changing, changing landscape of development finance on the continent. From December 2014 to January 2018, he served as Liberia's Minister of Public Works with oversight over the construction and maintenance of public infrastructure. And prior to that, he served as Deputy Chief of Staff to President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and head of the President's uh, Delivery Unit. He currently serves on the Board of Advisors of the Master of Science in Foreign Service program at Georgetown University. Um, he holds a bachelor's in political science from Berea College, and he received his master's in foreign service from Georgetown. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Professor Jianye Wang. Professor Wang holds a number of positions. He is Professor of Economics and Co-Director of the Volatility Institute at NYU Shanghai. He is also Dean of the Guangzhou Institute of International Finance, uh, the Managing Director of Silk Road Fund Company Limited, and the Rotating Secretary General of the International Working Group on Export Credits. Prior to joining NYU, he was uh, Economic Counselor and uh, Chief Economist of the Export Import Bank of China, held various positions at the IMF, and also served as adjunct professor of economics at Peking University School of Economics. He holds a PhD in MA uh, in economics from Columbia University and a BA from Peking University. Please note that all of our discussants are commenting on the paper and presentation solely in their individual capacity as scholars and experts in their respective fields. Their views do not necessarily reflect any official views of their respective current or past institutions. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Dollar. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to join this panel. Uh, I really enjoyed the paper and the presentation. And so I'd just like to amplify the three main things I learned from this. You know, so first, uh, the presentation shows very clearly you know, that China has a long history of assisting countries that are having debt problems, problems repaying different loans owed to China you know, and to others. Uh, and I, what we learned is uh, for the zero interest loans, which were always rather small in quantity, there has been some actual debt forgiveness. More recently, China has lent a lot of money to African countries. Uh, and what we see uh, in the database is examples of extending the terms, you might call that loan modification, but as Deborah emphasized at the end, relatively few cases of reducing the principal or reducing the interest rate. I thought it was interesting that a lot of this has been in parallel with the HIPAA initiative and with IMF programs. That Republic of Congo example was a very nice illustration of Chinese modification going hand in hand with the IMF program. So China has a history of working, at least informally, alongside the traditional Western institution. Now, the second point I wanna make is that COVID-19 is having a devastating effect on Africa. It's not clear how serious the health epidemic will be, 
but it's very clear that the economic recession is very serious. The World Bank is projecting that per capita GDP will decline by 5% this year and then grow by zero next year. So that's two lost years during which poverty will certainly increase. And it's very interesting that China has gone along with this G20 call for a debt moratorium. Uh, and so that seems to be the first time that China's working from the inside rather just in parallel. You can use the Cary database to figure out who are the large clients for China in Africa. Uh, most of them are covered by this debt moratorium from the G20. So I think that's a good first step. But the debt moratorium is really a very small first step. It just means countries do not have to make payments during the rest of 2020, but interest continues to accrue, so by the end of the year, they'll have more debt. If there's a very sharp global recession followed by quick recovery, then probably that debt moratorium is sufficient, uh, but I certainly don't expect that kind of V-shaped recovery. I think probably many parts of the world economy will be struggling for years, and so this debt moratorium is just a first step. Uh, looking at the major clients of China in Africa based on the Cary data set, about half of the major clients are in debt distress right now, according to IMF analysis, and many of them are going to the IMF. So probably there will be a need well beyond this initial debt moratorium. Now, the third point I wanna make is, it, it was very helpful to get some statistics that. 17% of, of Africa's external debt is to China, compared to 18% to the World Bank. Paris Club countries haven't really lent much to Africa in recent years, so they're very small. But I wanna add as my third point, what's really new in the world is most of Africa's external debt is owed to private bondholders. 31% of Africa's external debt is owed to private bondholders, compared to that 17% figure for China. Uh, so in looking at the need perhaps for real haircuts or cuts in interest rates, more serious debt relief, the private sector will be critical. And I think this is gonna be quite difficult. You know, in that recent case of Argentina, the private sector held out for full payment, took Argentina to Western courts, seized assets. Uh, so this could really be a problem so looking at the general debt issue for Africa, you know, you've got the traditional donors like the World Bank working with the Paris Club. China, important though its size financially is often exaggerated. And then this very important private sector contribution. So frankly, this has a danger of being a big mess. And the last point I wanna make is I think it's in China's interest to work closely with the traditional uh, creditors like the World Bank working through the Paris Club together with African countries. The big challenge is going to be to get the private sector into the debt relief effort in order to get these countries on a sustainable path. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dollar. Um, Jude, can we have you, uh, your comments? Sure, thank you. Again, uh, uh, thanks to Deborah and team for, for the invitation. It's good to be here. Um, Great paper, had a chance to, to review the paper before, and, and excellent paper. I come at the paper from the perspective of the people who are currently in the position that I occupied before, either as members of the cabinet, members of the economic management team, or advisors to the president in terms of how the country responds to the current economic crisis that we're having. And as you heard in Yoon's introductions, introduction of, my, of, of me, my focus has been the changing landscape of financing in Africa and the rise, and then I'll pick up on where Dr. Dollars uh, um, left off, the rise of non-Paris club members in terms of lending and the rise especially of private lenders on the continent. Um, as it stands, almost every single African sovereign bond is now in double digits, they're all junk. And there still seems to be some sort of appetite for African lending, for African debt. The problem here is, and I, this is the problem that I try to um, present in my writing and in my, in my commentary. If you're an African government and there is an issue of debt distress, 
what creditor do you want to negotiate with? Do you want to negotiate with um, hedge funds, um, um, private lenders, uh, multiple private lenders, I mean, a good number of them, or do you want to deal with a single actor as in China? And so in terms of preparing the, the president of a country or preparing a country's proposal, this paper is very useful. First, because it tells you, um, you, you get an idea of what China has done before. We have a Chinese Communist Party and a Chinese government for whom social stability is really important, which means you can expect that there's not going to be a significant departure from what they've done in the past before. They're going to be conservative in terms of their, their behavior. And so what has China done before? What kinds of loans have China written off before? Does, is China going to participate in a multilateral effort or in a bilateral effort? Because it helps the country in terms of determining how we're going to engage the Chinese. And so this paper is very useful in that regard. The second thing is, the second point I want to make is, and Chinkwa Lee's beautiful book, The, the Perspective of a Global China, she makes a distinction between Chinese capital and unfettered private capital. That whereas the bottom line for uh, regular private capital is simply uh, profit making, Chinese capital beyond profit making, they sometimes have national security or national interest uh, um, objective, which means because there is an element of a political re, uh, um, objective to Chinese capital. If you're an African government that uh, faces the Chinese creditor, there is room for negotiation there. And, and that negotiation is actually more useful because as the paper showed, that even in the Paris club process, there are times when there are punitive actions. Whereas in the long history of Chinese lending, we see no punitive action there. And so if you're an African government faced with these different creditors, you want to be able to negotiate with the Chinese. Again, it's not to say that the Chinese presence is you know, an unfettered uh, and unalloyed good. The point I'm trying to make is that from the perspective of an African government negotiating with creditors, China stands out to be a creditor you want to negotiate with. Um, the final thing I, I, I want to say on the paper is that there is a lot of, there's a lot written about Chinese and Chinese behavior and Chinese actions, especially around the issue of debt. Most especially advice to African governments to fear that China is going to seize flagship infrastructure and national assets. The paper demonstrates that in the entire history of Chinese lending, there has been no asset seizure. And so it's not to say that China might not get to a place where there will be asset seizure, but it's important that as countries face their face this unprecedented uh, effect of COVID-19 and the economic damage that is brought to most countries, especially in terms of revenue, as the countries face, um, as they create the, their engagement strategy with creditors, it is important to be able to have a good historical briefing on what China has done in the past, what kinds of loan China has waived in the past, and what China is likely to do. And I think this paper is very, very instructive. So if I were in my previous position, this is the kind of paper I want to read before I brief the president. And even when the economic, economic management team meets to present to the president of a country what a path is gonna take in terms of engaging creditors, this is the kind of information we would like will be useful in being able to do that. And so because of that, I think this is an excellent addition to what's been written already about China and debt, especially regarding Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Jude. Um, and our last discussant is uh, Professor Wang. Uh, okay, um, my, my comment, uh, I, in my comment, I want to make four points. Uh, first, uh, I think the authors uh, have made uh, impressive efforts in collecting relevant data and cases. A variety, a wide variety of sources, measurement, and other issues, no doubt, made the data verification and reconciliation difficult if not impossible. Despite the difficulties, the authors have managed to put together a broad involving picture of Chinese debt relief to Africa. The account of China's debt relief in 1980 to 2000, 
in a debt cancellation in 2000 to 2018 or 19, today's uh, uh, chart, as illustrated in box two of the paper, are broadly on the mark. The findings, such as no asset seizures, uh, are telling. Their analysis also yields important insights, notably from a creditor's perspective, there is no China incorporation. From a historical perspective, China as an official creditor started providing debt relief bilaterally, then parallel to multilateral initiatives, and later within the multilateral initiative. As indicated at the outset, the paper aims to uncover patterns of Chinese debt relief. However, the paper's analytical framework, organizing along the types of debt treatment, i.e. debt restructuring vis-a-vis -vis cancellation, debt cancellation, in my humble opinion, may not be the most productive in achieving the paper's goals. Conceptually, there are clear distinctions between commercial, bilateral official, and multilateral creditors and their treatment of distressed debt due to the differences in their source of funding, their ability for budgetary recourse, and tax, regulatory, and other limitations and implications. Therefore, there are good reasons historically these creditors had a separate forum of debt negotiation and settlements, London Club for commercial banks, Paris Club for developed bilateral official creditors, and the World Bank IMF for multilateral debt relief. Now, given the above, I have a few suggestions. I would first, I would recommend the authors to review their data and organize their analysis by the type of creditors, in some cases, by type of debt. This would help increase clarity. For example, in table one and two, mixing official development assistance by the Ministry of Commerce, commercial export credits, and bank lending for project financing, and corporate supplies credits made the tables hard to read, and even harder to uncover patterns of debt relief. The challenges, of course, are that uh, China has experienced dramatic and rapid structural changes. The types of lenders proliferated over the last two decades. Under the same name, some financial institutions changed their business nature, scope, and regulatory constraints drastically over the period. From more of a physical agency to increasingly commercial, not only in the type of lending facility, but also regulatory constraints, especially after the capitalization, which was given in exchange for banking prudential requirements, oversight, and of course, ensuing consequences. To sort this out in the Chinese context is difficult, but not impossible. My second suggestion is uh, uh, to look at China's financial relations with Africa by the stage of China's development, measured by GMP per capita, uh, using the World Bank definition of least developed country, low income country, and lower middle country over the last four decades. I think that should shed light on the changing patterns of creditors and their ob objectives, capabilities, and limitations in dealing with debt problems. Uh, my third suggestion is uh, uh, to, to, to conduct analysis by the commodity cycle. This line of research utilizes data depicted in your figure one would help untangle the rise and fall of lending, differentiate liquidity vis-a-vis -vis solvency problems, and highlight the role of risk management and credit, creditor debtor coordination throughout the commodity and economic cycle in ensuring debt sustainability. 
my, I don't know, I have enough time. I, I, I want to say a few words on, on, on transparency. I, I share the author's call for transparency. My discussions above have shown that over the decades of institutional trans transition, decentralization, commercialization, ownership, diversification, principal agent problems, and asymmetric information are not uncommon and obscure the true picture and appropriate classification of Chinese financial dealings with Africa. So increasing transparency, therefore, will require not only streamlining information verification and collection, but also structural and institutional reforms in China. Uh, in this regard, the newly created International Development Cooperation Agency was a positive step. I have some other my, minor comments, but I think my time probably up and I I may not go into de detail. I just want to say uh, MDRI does not belong to uh, your table three, which is on Paris Club. By the way, Paris Club, it's not a multilateral institution. It's not the multilateral, it's not the, even an institution. Okay, I thank you. Thank you to all of our discussants for their comments. Um, I'm gonna uh, throw the ball back in our paper paper presenters court. Um, and I know we only have about 14 minutes left in this event. Um, Marie and I have been going through the questions and several of them um, are similar. So um, I'm gonna um, try to uh, compile a few of them and maybe give you three at a time. If um, we can, if we have more time after that, I'll uh, continue and do another three. Um, First uh, quick question that came from the floor was, um, what are the sources of the carry data? Um, there were a number of questions that asked about the um, differences between uh, commercial private banks and state lending. Uh, for example, how should we think about the Chinese China Development Bank and China Exim Bank? Are these commercial? Um, what are the differences between the different lenders? And following on that, there were a number of questions asking for um, some further um, response about President Xi Jinping's statement yesterday in terms of which kinds of loans are included um, in the uh, statement that he made. Um, and finally, um, uh, one more question is, uh, will debt cancellation um, affect future borrowing or credit ratings of the African countries or the countries that are requesting um, debt forgiveness. So if we can start with those, um, I'll see if we have time for more. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, those are all interesting questions. I'm going to turn it over to Kevin for the question about the sources of the carry data because he's in charge of that. Kevin? Sure. So we use a, a variety of sources uh, for our data. Um, our, our main sources are African government sources and, and Chinese government sources. The Ministry of Commerce websites uh, for each individual embassy are often a, a, an official source from the Chinese side and um, parliamentary uh, documents and uh, Ministry of Finance budget documents are all are, um, sources that we use uh, on the African side. And then we also use um, media reports from both China, Africa, and the international to help uh, triangulate the data. Thank you, Kevin. So all of our sources are, are open sources. We also are able, at least in the past, when we could travel, because we have such an extensive network, we could uh, track things down doing field work in Africa. And also because of our contacts, we can even by emails try to check out things. So that's an additional uh, advantage that we have. In terms of the commercial versus non-commercial, this really is the, the crux of the matter. And uh, I'll speak about um, Xi Jinping's an announcement yesterday in a moment. But our understanding is that China Development Bank was commercialized in 2008. Um, however, they still were, were, they remain a policy bank. So, but they're full, they operate on fully commercial principles. So I would think that in any, um, even though they are a policy bank, that they are probably considered by the Chinese leadership to be in that commercial bank category. 
China Exim Bank is, is um, as uh, Professor Wang could tell us if he's um, willing to speak about this, but China Exim Bank has, they're the only um, issuer of the subsidized preferential loans and the uh, concessional loans. So they are, uh, and those are subsidized by the Ministry of Finance. So those elements would not be commercial. But China Exim Bank also has a lot of commercial instruments. So it's a kind of hybrid. Part of it is commercial and part of it is non-commercial. And the non-commercial part is a much smaller portion of it. So it, nonetheless, it is an export credit agency. Everything it does is, uh, is supporting government policies in terms of export credits. So in that sense, um, there could be an argument made that the whole thing, uh, China Exim Bank, ought to fall under the DSSI as an official arm of the Chinese government. But I imagine that's not how it's going to be worked out in Beijing. In terms of uh, Xi Jinping's announcement yesterday, I, I pulled it up on my other screen. And it seems to me that, um, that the statement that we encourage Chinese financial institutions to respond to this and to work out arrangements, um, that isn't a mandate. So it's, uh, it's, to me anyway, it seems more along the lines of um, a president of any country saying, you know, we would like our commercial banks to follow along with this, but we, we, aren't, uh, we can't require them to do that. So that's what I suspect is, is meant behind that. And so then the, uh, the DSSI itself would apply to those intergovernmental loans, to particularly the concessional loans, the preferential export buyers credits, and perhaps other special state loans. Um, and if Professor Wang could shed any light on this, I, I would be grateful for that. Will debt cancellation affect the uh, credit ratings of countries or will debt relief? Uh, yes. And we already see countries like Kenya saying that they don't want to go through the DSSI in part because it would affect their credit ratings. It's already affected several countries. Um, they have been downgraded. I think Ethiopia is one of them. But Kenya also, uh, the DSSI, um, mandates that countries that go into that um, arrangement cannot take out uh, commercial loans during that period. And Kenya wants to, and other countries, want to leave that avenue open, even though um, almost all these countries have their ratings at, at junk ratings right now, as, as David Dollar pointed out. I'll stop. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I wonder if um, any of our discussants have any uh, comments or responses to the questions? Yeah, I was just going to add to Deborah's point about the loss of credit rating for African uh, countries. Um, for some of the hedge funds and pension funds, they, can't, they cannot hold on to assets that are in default. And so a suspension of payments is technically default. And consequently, that's going to have an effect. And again, it comes back to the, to the Kenya question, why um, in, in an effort to retain access to international financial markets, they're uh, stepping away from the, the G20 pr um, program or other uh, debt program that will suspend um, um, uh, payments and, and interest rates. However, not all of them are, are going to go that route. I think uh, some of, depending on how, how, how hard they hit, I mean, some countries might, in the end, uh, it might be the best option out for them. Can I just add briefly, so I think Deborah, you know, really centered in on this key issue of which of the Chinese loans will be considered commercial and which official. Let me just say the China Development Bank is obviously wholly owned by the Chinese government. It's subject to different regulation than Chinese commercial banks. And a lot of its loans are guaranteed by the recipient governments or parastatal companies. So that's gonna be an interesting fight. I mean, and that's a big chunk of the data I think it'll be tough for China to argue that CDB loans are commercial and to try to exclude that from initial debt moratorium and later debt relief. I, I'm just guessing there's going to be a lot of pressure on China uh, to end up including that CDB debt as official debt. Professor Wang, did you have anything uh, you wanted to add? I think I already said what I, 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 I need to say, uh, but uh, I, I think I, I, we don't have time for it to hear for, 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 for debate, uh, but uh, uh, it, it is a, a crucial uh, to differentiate between official government lend, lend, lending 
let me repeat, you know, lenders are different in their source of funding, their ability for budgetary recourse and, 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 and other constraint and limitations in tax and, and, uh, and regulatory uh, and, and, and those aspects. So I think that these, uh, 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 so, so when, you, when you look all these things and, and you look at each creditors, each agency, uh, each, each institutions or banks or, 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 or others, I think that they just have to, you cannot just look op the ownership. You have to look at all, all, all these uh, relevant uh, issues, uh, matters. Thank you. Um, we have a few more minutes, so I wanted to go through a couple more questions um, and see if um, our panelists could answer um, these uh, before the end of the session. Um, the first question was, are all African countries requesting debt cancellation from uh, China? Um, and then in, in um, a, a sort of flip side of this, what factors does China consider um, when it's considering debt restructuring or debt cancellation? Um, and uh, is Africa, are African countries treated differently from other countries? Um, and then there was a, a number, there were a number of questions specifically asking about the Angola case. Um, and I don't know if we have time to get into that, but um, I wanted to put that on the table. Uh, let me address the question about um, our African country, what are African countries asking for? The short answer is that, that we don't know. This is all, you know, this is a, a, a live, it's, it's an ongoing set of issues. We do understand there, there have been uh, restructuring negotiations going on in a number of countries even before COVID-19. And then others, uh, other countries, that we know Angola, for example, has been in touch uh, with Beijing and they are uh, in discussions or hoping to be in discussions about restructuring. But I think that um, the, one of the questions we don't know the answer to is, is that question of, is this a liquidity problem or an insolvency problem? So, and the, the remedies would be different. If it's a temporary liquidity problem, then restructuring, uh, extending repayment periods um, would be in order so that countries have breathing space. That's what the moratorium is about. And then Xi Jinping's comments, he said, we are actually encouraging this moratorium to be extended longer. We would like the G20 to, to talk about already extending it beyond those eight months. So I think that's clearly going to be necessary. But country by country, uh, whether or not this leads to insolvency, you know, whether countries really are, are go bankrupt um, on, on the basis of these, uh, the COVID-19 impact, that remains to be determined. Some countries are going to have bigger problems than others. And, I think the jury is still out on, on just what that's going to mean. Clearly, there's a recession across the continent, but it's uneven. Um, so what factors will China consider? I think it will consider, um, I think there's still going to be a lot of consideration loan by loan um, because the loans were, were offered loan by loan and they were offered in terms of the, the impact that they would have on what's called development sustainability rather than the overall debt sustainability. And the Chinese have now um, signed on to, they've, they've uh, issued their own debt sustainability framework. So this thinking may be different where lending in the future will be done more on the basis of the entire uh, country's debt position rather than looking at a project. But let me give you an example of telecoms. Right now, the telecom sector in Africa is still vibrant. Country, uh, people are using their cell phones, they're, we hope they're paying their bills. So there's revenue in, the, in that sector to repay those loans. And that might not be the case for a train. When people are, are um, uh, kept at home, they're not riding around on trains. And so those revenues are going to be uh, falling. Uh, I would just add that outside the Ethiopian prime minister, um, I haven't heard other African heads of states or finance ministers calling for blanket debt relief. I doubt that we're going to see or hear um, African, especially finance ministers, calling for blanket debt relief simply because of the implication it has for their continuing access to, to financing. So I, and, and on the question of whether, again, as the paper shows and as the research shows, 
China has historically dealt with, with loans on a case by case basis and not on a portfolio basis. So again, but, but all of this is unusual. What's happening with COVID-19 is new and there is a possibility that that might change. Uh, If uh, none of our other panelists um, have any further comments, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I've noted some comments about how we organize things and we'll take those into consideration for our next event, uh, which will take place next week. Um, again, thank you to uh, my Kerry colleagues and to our esteemed discussants for their time and efforts. Um, I know everyone's been working really hard reading, commenting, sending things back and forth over the uh, past uh, several months. So uh, this has been a lot of work in um, making this one hour presentation available to everyone. Um, if you had to step away from the event at any point, or if you want to recommend this event to your colleagues, um, the whole thing has been recorded um, and uh, we will be sharing a link um, to with everyone who registered early next week. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, the working paper is also available on our website. A shortened policy brief version will also be available shortly. Um, if you go to your chat, Marie's already um, put some links to those um, documents um, on the chat. Um, they will also be up on our website. Um, if you enjoyed this event, there is more to come. Um, our next event titled, What Happens If Borrowers Default? Chinese lending, sovereign immunity, and the Kenyan railway case um, will again feature um, our own Professor Deborah Bradigam, together with Professor Juan Kidane, who is Fulbright Scholar and tenured Associate Professor of Law at the Seattle University School of Law. This will, um, event will take place next Thursday, same time, and you should be able to sign up for it um, by the end of the week. Finally, if you're not on our mailing list, please sign up so you can keep abreast of all of uh, these things. Um, I know that there were a lot of questions that weren't answered and um, we'll figure out if there's some way that we can address these, um, at least in writing in some way to the people who asked those questions. So again, thank you all very much for joining us and we hope to see you next week. <laughs>